You are so very welcome to this question and answer session with the lovely Marina Gallan. We'll be here for about an hour and the floor will open very quickly. The way we'll get going is I'll ask Marina a question and then it's, it's a free for all. Whoever would like to ask a question, it will just go in a um, chronological basis. But I'll ask Martin Dara from our mastermind group to first give an introduction into Marina. So Martin, all yours. Sure. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Marina, for being here. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us. I uh, I think that it's only fair to introduce Marina as I was introduced to her, and it was simply, <laughs> very simply stated in an email that she is very easy to fall in love with. That was how I was introduced to her before I knew anything about her, knew even what she did or anything that she was up to, and uh, have to say that that statement was completely accurate. <laughs> and I met her once and immediately fell in love with her, and and now uh, we've had a good uh, a good friendship over the last couple of months. But she is a a three P coach, one of the members on the the three P board and has a podcast I listen to regularly called the school for mystics podcast, which she co-hosts with another uh, gentleman. And, uh, and she lives in Mexico with her three boys and, uh, and is responsible for bringing the three P's into the Spanish community. So she translated it, um, translated a lot of different things into Spanish and now runs her programs in Spanish. But, uh, but, I think that's enough from me, Marina. Thanks so much for, for being here. I hope I hit on some of the main points, but I think that that first one was really the one to, to, to make sure I included in this. Mm, thank you, Martin. I don't, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> because I think it's really easy to just fall in love, period. No? We make it really complicated, but it's really easy. <laughs> so we just need to allow those feelings to be evoked by something or someone outside of us and but recognize that it is in us so i'm glad i somehow made you recognize the love in you <laughs> you certainly have thank you so much <laughs> sweet sweet thank you very much and thank you very much everybody for having me i am so thrilled so honored so happy and excited to be here really it is indeed our pleasure to have you with us, Marina. And um, I'm just gonna get the ball rolling. I thought of something today because in our last few calls, not everyone is familiar with the three principles background. So I'm just gonna launch this poll and if everyone could take maybe five seconds and pick one of the options. If you're familiar with the three principles understanding, that would be great. It would help us plan for future webinars as well. But Marina, I'd like to get the ball rolling by asking a very simple question. I know that, and I've seen again and again, the answer to complexity is always simplicity. So I want to ask you in the most simple way possible, what are the three principles and why are they important? So simple. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So the three principles, very simply put, are an attempt to describe how life works. And it is a simple attempt because it reduces life to its most basic principles, which are mind, thought, and consciousness. Now, how I would explain that today would be, there is a universal energy that is wise and kind and playful that is out to explore possibility. And so it manifests 
as both consciousness and thought. The way I see it this morning, consciousness would be, <laughs> I don't know why this is coming up, consciousness would be like the, the sacred feminine and thought would be the sacred masculine. So consciousness as a space of possibility, an empty space of possibility, a void, which is immediately filled by its opposite, the action, the, the, the form of it all. And by coming together, they create experience. Another way of putting it would be a very still lake and then wind blowing over it and you have waves, right? And the waves are not of the wind and they are not of the lake. They are simply what happens when the lake and the wind. Is. And so basically put experience, life is what happens when thought and consciousness interact, but they are animated by the source, which is of course mine. Why are they important? Man, they are important because understanding the origin and the source of experience allows us to change our relationship with experience. And it allows us to interact and collaborate with it in a completely new, different way, which is more graceful and uh, invites us to create way less unnecessary suffering, frustration, pain. And by doing that, our collaboration with life becomes more simple and more meaningful. Does that answer your question, Thomas? <laughs> I think that absolutely is nail on the head. That answers my question. Thank you so much, Marina. Beautiful okay. introduction. Beautiful. I am, I am glad the words that came today are, are useful to you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, wonderful. To everyone else in attendance, if you would like to ask a question, please, under the reactions tab, just press raise hand and you'll be put in the queue and we will come to you, to you in order. And while we're waiting for people to, to um, ask a question, Marina, I might just ask, in your lovely answer there, you said that simply understanding these principles of psychological functioning makes life more simple and more graceful. Perhaps you'd like to say a little bit more about how that makes life more simple. Well, for me, You know, a lot of people out there say that when they found the principles, they found the missing piece of the puzzle and then they put the piece of the puzzle and everything makes sense. For me, it was quite the opposite. For me, finding the principles was like suddenly a light shone on the pieces and I saw that I had so many more than I needed. And I was trying to put them all together and make them fit and suddenly it was like, oh no, you know, there's only like five of them. It's so simple. we get so easily lost in what we think we are who we think we are what we think is important what we think is valuable that isn't and the principles really are like that light which allows us to see what is actually relevant, what is actually important, 
what is actually true, what is actually real, and what is useful in our path to ourselves, to well-being, and what isn't. Does that make sense, Thomas? It sure does, Marina. I mean, on many levels. The energy behind the words, I think, more so. <laughs> okay. Our first question of the night is from Fina. She has her hand up. So, Fina, the floor is yours if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Marina a question. Hi, Fina. Hello, Marina. Thanks for your time this evening. Thanks for what time it is there. For me, it's uh, evening. Um, my question is, well, let me lead you to my question rather. So as, a, as principals, I've only known this for like three um, months or so, but because of the spiritual upbringing I've had, the concept has been familiar. So it was like, ah, this is well packaged sort of a thing when I came across the principles. And I just found it very appealing uh, and easy to talk to people when uh, it's wrapped up as a principles without any religious connotations and all that. But one of the things that I find people are quick to dismiss is perhaps because of the simplicity of the principles and especially the point around where our reality, our experience is created through our thought, um, mind and consciousness, mainly the thought. Uh, that come to us. So things that um, people argue about, like poverty is not something I create in my head. Are you suggesting that I'm creating it? I'm in a violent relationship. I'm not creating that violence and, and so on. The way I see it is you're not necessarily creating, you're not Im imagining the violence, you're not imagining the poverty, but by seeing that your experience is still created in your head, you open possibilities of changing that experience at some point in time. If you don't see it that way, and if you're just going to say, okay, it's all happening around me, which means you do not have any role to play in it, I feel like you're just losing the opportunity to open the doors to possibilities. That's how I see it. Of course, it takes a good level of communication to help clients see it as well. But when you come across uh, this sort of dismissive argument, what would your response be? Have you come across such dismissive argument in the first place? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. <laughs> I would have thought so. Yeah, I live with three teenagers, Vina, so you can imagine that. <laughs> of course, they are not creating it. It's real. So, I think there are different ways to go about it. But basically, what, what I would try to point to is the fact that when we place ourselves as passive receivers of circumstance and passive receivers of experience, we are giving away our own power to have anything to do with it, to change anything. We are giving our way, our roles as co-creators of our reality. When, I'm gonna tell you a story, Vina. One day, one of my sons, he must have been, I don't know, 12 years old, 13 years old. He came home from school with the grades, the report, right? And in this report, they have the grades, but they all every teacher writes down a comment. And so I was, you know, reading the grades, reading him to him the comments, he was listening to them. And every everything I would say, he would say, oh, that happened because my, my team uh, was not working correctly, and so there was nothing I could do about it. And I said, okay, so I went to the following and, oh, that, that day I was, I was sick and so I was not at my best and da da da, -da. Okay, and, and on and on and on we went and he kept blaming everything, right? 
So when we got to the end of the report card, he was feeling really proud of himself, you know, and he said, so what do you think, mom? And I said, well, the only thing that makes me really, really sad is that nothing in here is your fault. And he was really confused. So he looked at me and was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if nothing is your fault, for your fault, it means you're powerless against it. So I guess your grades will always be like this. And he got really quiet and he said, can you read those comments to me again, please? So <laughs> we went through the comments again and he really had a different perspective then. And he wanted so much to claim responsibility. Do you see what I mean? And so we went step by step and he was absolutely clear on which ones there was something he could do about and which ones were completely out of his hands, which were like two, right? And so when we, when we had the list of, you know, the ones that you can do something about and the ones that you don't, we had a beautiful conversation of, okay, so what are you going to do about it? And it was, it became really evident to him that he needed to talk to his teacher. So he went to school the next day and he went to the teacher and said, okay, I have observed this and this is what I see. I can do this, 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 and this, but these two, there is nothing I can do about, but you can. So I need your help in this too. Do you see the, the completely different approach of collaboration there is there? Right? So in the examples that you are bringing, Vina, we constantly miss how our active roles as, as creators of our experience impact the circumstance we are in. They would seem like separate things. You know, one thing is the circumstance and another thing is my experience of the circumstance. And I have nothing to do with circumstance, but I am the creator of my experience. But no, that's the whole point. When we claim responsibility for the experience we are creating and we suddenly have the possibility of choosing more wisely how we manage our experience that directly and powerfully impacts circumstance, changes circumstance. So that if I am in a violent relationship, I am not creating the violence, it would seem, but I might be creating the violence through my identity as powerless and weak. I might be creating the violence as helpless in life if it were not for that person. So even though it would seem like a completely separate thing, it isn't. We are active collaborators in life. We are co-creators of reality. And the way we co-create reality is by navigating our experience of reality. It's not, it might not be an evident thing, thing, but it is very simple. Is this making sense, Vina? Yeah, it is. It, it confirms what I was thinking as, you know, being the powerless, because you often get into this um, loop of thinking that they can't do anything. And, and over time, I've seen some people that start accepting what the violent partner is actually saying, you know, all the ridicule and all that that's going on. They start believing that's in fact true rather than um, questioning it, it in their head and, and shut the doors on the possibilities of getting out of there and making a life for themselves. So for me, I think the, the tricky part is going to be moving on quickly from making them realize that they are co-creators because then there is that risk of, oh, it's all my fault, um, pitfall, and then jump to the solution side. So you realize you're a co-creator so that you can take some responsibility. It shows that you have the ball in your court to do something and jump into the solution realm. Well, Vina, guess what? 
if you see it as tricky, what experience are you creating? I think it, it's going to be quite interesting this one because apart from you know some of the practitioners that I've uh, I've talked to like uh, in such forums the presence the energy that we get out of that I think they replace the importance of words but they until I get to that point I think the choice of words are going to be very important so I'm looking forward to my journey I am looking forward to your journey as well <laughs> Open a nice way. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Vina. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Cheers. Thank you, Vina. It's a pleasure to see you back again. And now we're moving over to Sam Ezioni. I hope I'm saying that right. Sam, you can unmute yourself. Come on on. Hi, Thomas. Yeah, that was perfect pronunciation there. Um, <laughs> hi, Marina. Uh, hi, Sam. It's lovely to meet you. Um, I really heard something you said before about the the masculine energy of thought and the feminine energy of consciousness, which was a kind of a different way that I haven't actually conceived of the principles before. Um, and I kind of hear it's almost in getting your conversation with Vina just just then about how it's almost when we allow ourselves to be guided by our wisdom, we know when to assume that more masculine energy of action and when to also or be the, the active participator and then when to kind of fall back into the position of spectator, if that kind of makes sense. But I'd love to hear more about that kind of distinction there. Okay, the first thing I want to say, Sam, is feminine and masculine are just ways of calling it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is not, this has nothing to do with anything else. Yes? Okay, good. Right, okay. So I don't, I, it's become really difficult for me to see those as separate. So they're like two sides of the same coin. One cannot be without the other, right? So I understand that the intellect polarizes them. But when we leave the intellect behind and we go beyond concepts, they come together and, and, and they are the unity of life, the oneness of life. So we might think that sometimes we are active in action and sometimes we are passive as spectators but we are both at the same time all the time we cannot not be now it seems as though there are times when we are being receptive and then there are times when we are being more active i agree with you completely totally but we there it's the yin and yang there's always a little bit of the one in the other yes now here's the other thing i want to say about this son. i think it seems to me that one of the great misunderstandings that we live in is that we can waste time Right? And so we are obsessed with doing, obsessed with creating, obsessed with action. And we miss so much of the richness of just being, just waiting, just existing, just being present. In my experience, when you allow yourself the time to be in that space, to just be, to just receive, to just be informed. You become sort of a channel, you know, because and you are being informed from circumstance and reality, but you are being informed from universal wisdom at the same time so that you can rest in that space. And at some point, you will want to do something you will be moved forward towards something because that is our nature i mean look at look at babies they are always 
just being and then at some point they they are inspired to move they are inspired to do stuff and they never get it wrong like they just go it's not personal and because they are moving from that space they have endless power and energy to insist you know and persevere on what they are doing because it is not about creating something from here that I should be doing or I must be doing or I want to be doing no it's it's a completely different kind of movement that kind of action I really enjoy that kind of action I really trust But we cannot find that kind of natural movement and inspiration if we do not stop before to just be and rest and, and allow ourselves to feel it. You know, like this morning I was, I was sitting with a client and <laughs> I gave her 10 minutes to do whatever she wanted to do. But I asked her to please not do what she had to do or her to-do list or what she should do. I asked her to, I gave her 10 minutes of our sessions to just do what she really, really wanted to do. And she was completely lost. She had no idea of what she wanted to do. You know, she had to stand there for like six of those 10 minutes saying, I, She had no idea. And then she relaxed and she waited and she was perfectly okay. She looked out the window, the sun was hitting her face. It was beautiful. And then at some point she said, I'd like to have some water. And she got up and got some water and that was it. But she saw the difference. Like she realized just how easy it was to just stop and, and be in that space of emptiness, of void that will be filled because that's nature. There are no voids, right? Everything is filled up. As soon as there is a void, it's filled up with something. But it is filled up from wisdom and from life and intelligence and we get to be collaborators in that why why would we choose anything different is this making any sense Sam? I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. <laughs> it feels lovely and I don't want to think about it too much. <laughs> so yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Sam. Our next question, Marina, is coming all the way from Kuwait and it's Firas, who's a member of our mastermind group. So Firas, you can unmute yourself and come on on. Thank you, Thomas. Hi, Marina. It's lovely to see you again. Pleased to see you. Thank you so much you. for being here. So wonderful. Um, I had an original question, which I'm going to try and stick to. What you, what you told Sam brought up maybe half a dozen other ones, but I'll see what comes up. <laughs> um, I love what you said in the beginning, in the intro, about the beauty of the understanding the, the principles is it makes things so much simpler. And I've seen that for myself over the past year. But mostly, it's helped me with taking back that kind of feeling of control or, or, or giving up that feeling of helplessness with relationships, you know, people that felt like they've wronged me or haven't understood me and so on. So it's helped tremendously with my relationship with my daughters, two of them are teenagers, and the third one's a toddler. That's helped me with my relationship with my wife, uh, things that have been going on over the past year. So that's been beautiful. It's, it's helped a lot. But on the flip side, I've also gotten like really caught up in 
guess my, I could say my relationship with myself. It's like the things that, how I think and how I feel about myself. That's got me thinking even more about that. And I can see myself getting caught up in that thinking. And that's where I'm start. I'm struggling to see the simplicity of it. The more I look at it, the more I kind of <laughs> generate more thinking about it. Why am I not doing this? And just what you're saying to Sam about trying to figure out what it is I really want to do versus what I feel like I want to do, and then judging myself for not doing that and so on. So I'd love if you could uh, speak to that. Yeah, well, I think our relationship with ourselves is the most difficult relationship we have. <laughs> no, because we are with us 100% of the time. <laughs> and we know our deepest secrets and our deepest thoughts and we cannot fool ourselves. Right? And so as, as simple as it may look in other people's lives, because we are seeing it from outside, when we are seeing it from inside, it looks absolutely different. I don't know how you are getting caught up in the relationship with yourself, but I can, I can tell you a little bit about how I get caught up in the relationship with myself. That might be helpful. Unless you want to tell me how you get caught up in the oh, no, because because then it would be a never ending call, it'd be a lot longer than now. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, but I'd love to, yeah. Okay. So I think the main reason why we get caught up in the relationship with ourselves is because of identity. And we are so blind to our own identity. You know, it's, a, it's like a chameleon. As soon as you see it, it just morphs into something else and you see it and it morphs into something else. On one side and on the other side, we are so attached to who we think we are. Luckily, the system is kind and wise, and so it doesn't let us get too far <laughs> in fooling ourselves, fit us, you know? And so the problem with the blind spots is that they can't be seen. But oh boy, do we feel them. Like we are constantly bumping up against them, and we know because it hurts. You know, I feel jealousy, there's a, there's a blind spot. I feel anger, there's a blind spot. I feel sadness, well, there's a blind spot. You know, like, it's just constant. So every time we are in pain, we have the opportunity to expand, to deepen our grounding, to see more than what we have seen. Whenever I get caught up in the relationship with myself, I remember that I need to take a step back because from where I am, there is no way I can solve it. There is no way I can dissolve it, right? And so the step in which direction feed us? Well, behind me, in the direction of source. Because I am creating the misunderstanding. I am creating the upset. I need to go before myself to the source of me. But I have learned to be incredibly patient with myself because I have to and incredibly kind to myself because otherwise you know I 
I wouldn't be able to go on. And so it has become very evident that, Fidas, the work is in this direction. Always. I cannot bring outside of me what there is not inside of me. There is no way I can do that. Now, on the other side, what is inside of me immediately impacts the world. I don't, I don't even need to bring it outside actively, right? So it's always in this direction. And so, forget judgment, bring in curiosity. So I'm feeling jealous. Huh, isn't that interesting? I'm feeling jealous. How come? I'm feeling sad. Huh, isn't that interesting? I'm feeling sad. How come? I'm feeling anger. Wow. What could that be about? Because judgment takes you in the opposite direction. Right? Now, curiosity and, and patience come together. You cannot be curious and not be patient. So if you, if you really get curious about what's going on, you become incredibly patient. And patience allows you to stay with it. You see, oh, I'm feeling jealousy. Huh, isn't that interesting? I'm not trying to run away from it. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sit with it. I'm willing to allow that feeling to inform me of whatever it needs to inform me. Because you see, Feelings are wisdom in action because they are the real-time reflection of my state of mind. They are wisdom in action. They are the thing that guides me. So I can stay with that guidance and I can sit with it and, and, and I can wait for it to tell me everything it needs to tell me. By the time they're done, I'm already in a completely different state. completely different. Every time I am in trouble with me, it is because I am in judgment of me. So you either stop thinking of yourself, which is wonderful as well, right? You cannot, you cannot be in conflict with yourself unless you're thinking about yourself. So you either stop thinking of yourself or you get really curious about yourself. And sometimes it will go one way and sometimes it will go another way and it's perfect. I have no idea what I'm saying is helpful because again, I have no idea of your relationship with you, Firas. No, no, it's tremendously helpful. Thank you so much because it's helped me realize why this understanding has helped me with my relationship with others is because it's allowed me to be curious and patient with them. But I was not being that patient with myself. And it's something I've been exploring the past couple of months. But whenever I, you, whenever I'm patient with myself, I, I start to see clearer and things become easier. But then I kind of override it with the thinking of, Oh, but I should be doing this better or faster or sooner. So the minute that I stop being patient is usually the minute that I go down the rabbit hole. So yes, that's that was tremendously helpful. Yeah, you go back into judgment. Into judgment, right? exactly. The minute I'm out of curiosity and patience is I fall back into judgment. Yeah. So it's interesting to see, Fidas, that we are consciousness and thought. Mm. You see, again, so you fall into consciousness and then you can get lost in thought and then you fall back into wondering and then you fall back into judgment and then you and and it's this happening all the time because that's what's supposed to happen not because we should be here all the time but because it's 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 an active process it's a living thing Yeah. The feedback loop. Thank you so much. 
was really helpful. Thank you for your question, Frida. That was beautiful. Shukran Jazilan Buras. Marina, we've received a question anonymously, so I won't say who it's from. And it says, I get the sense in the principles community that the ego is the enemy. So if the ego is the enemy and it's dissolved, isn't it a case then that we lose our individuality and our identity? I love this question so much. <laughs> Whoever asked it, thank you. There is no enemy. There can't be. You see, in order to wake up to something, we need something to wake up from. So, when we talk about surrendering to love and entering wholeness and oneness and the ego dissolving, when we are talking about that, we are talking about the soul's desire to merge with it. But yes, absolutely, when that happens, we completely dissolve. We, we cannot remain, right? They say, one of my first teachers used to, before the principles even, used to say, no ego can survive love. So we are all looking for that, but we are looking from it from individuality. So who is looking to dissolve? Who is looking to get enlightened? Who is, who is looking for the real deal? Right? This is looking for this. Now, we are humans. We are bound to the human dimension, which involves ego. I love my ego. It allows me to fall in love and allows me to, you know, suffer loss. It allows me to be me. It allows all the colors of the rainbow. It allows life. Like before ego, there is just experience, pure experience. From the moment there is ego, then I experience. I love, I hunger, I feel, and I look for love. I look for oneness. So it's the paradox of being caught in the human dimension in which you cannot go against nature because going against nature is part of nature too. Like love and rockets used to say. <laughs> yes. There is no enemy. Everything is in service of us. And everything is in service of our humanity and everything is in service of our enlightenment. Everything, even ego. It is an essential part of the whole process. Now, getting into, is it essential, is it necessary, yes, no, it becomes incredibly heady and intellectual. It's just about finding the good feeling finding the good feeling and surrendering to it. It doesn't matter if it's from ego or not from ego, it's, it's pointless. Sid Banks said, ego is whatever you want it to be because it is made up. Yeah, it's part of our creation. How important is it? As important as you make it, because it is made up. How bad is it? As bad as you make it, because it is made up. It's just one more figment of our imagination. It's just one more thought. 
as is I. I hope that made sense. That was fantastic, Marina. And I think it made a lot of sense for all of us on the call. I hope it made sense to whoever asked the question. <laughs> Me too. I'm kind of assuming, but <laughs> I'm going to pass over to, let me see. There's a few messages I have here. Um, okay. So we'll go over to Long Island, New York, to the creator of the Marty Palmy, Martin Dara, who has a question. And then Annette will come to you just before we close out on the hour. So Martin, you can unmute yourself and um, come on on. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thanks for that. So, um, Marina, my question to you um, revolves around being prepared. And the reason I ask that is because I had a misunderstanding of this because you spoke about wisdom and trusting wisdom in the moment. And so I took that to be you just have to like show up and and something's going to happen and if you're if you're giving a presentation you don't need to prepare you, you don't need a powerpoint or you could just show up and and every and just trust whatever shows up um and i'm starting to see more that the being prepared could be the wisdom just coming at an earlier point yeah <laughs> pretty much Yeah, Martin, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to win the marathon if I just show up. I'm not. There's a beautiful story about a biker that wanted to win a very serious international competition and trained for years and years and years and so finally he gets to the start of the competition and oh, he's you know flying and ev leaving everybody behind and everybody's so far behind him that he you know his he comes up the top of the hill and as he's racing down he's just enjoying the moment you know like savoring everything he had prepared for and as he's sliding down suddenly a crane whoo, swoops up and flies right in front of him like this and he stops and he's in such a state of shock that everybody's whoo, right you know racing up right in front of him and 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 he never gets back to the race and years later they are interviewing him and they ask him what made you lose the race and he says, I never lost the race, I left it. And I left it because I found what I was looking for in my encounter with the crane. What I was looking for at the, at the finish line, I found it with the crane. And so much more that I didn't even know I was looking for. And so, what this story points to is we can trust our guidance and we can trust our efforts way more than we can trust our goals. <laughs> you see, if this guy had known that he needed to find a crane, he would not have trained for the race. He would have gone to Japan to study some, something or the other. You see? we don't know what guidance is up to we don't know what wisdom is up to so we either trust it or we don't but it would seem like when we don't trust it we end up caught up in our thinking and made up worlds that create a lot of suffering and when we do we end up in places that we didn't even know we were looking for that we didn't know we had to go to 
and it might not make sense from the perspective of our minds but we are there and we are okay we found the crane we are perfectly okay does that make sense martin yeah of course it does <laughs> it's, it's 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 guidance is common sense It's nothing more than that. And I know in the in the community and in the understanding there's a lot of there's there's nothing to do. Yeah, there's nothing to do. That doesn't mean you don't you won't want to do anything, you know, or you you should suppress your desire to do stuff. No, you want to do something, go for it. You're inspired, trust that feels good and wonderful and awesome yes have it it can't take you somewhere you're not supposed to be but you need to listen and it's not coming from here and it's not coming from out there <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> Annette, the floor is yours. Thank you. And Marina, I love this conversation. It's so beautiful. I'm it's really so happy. good to see you, Annette. I've missed you. you it's too. been a long time. Yep. Uh, I was curious if you would elaborate a little bit about uh, what you talked about earlier about the um, being curious uh, and not judgmental about uh, when we have some awkward feeling that tells us that we're off, that my thinking is off, whether I'm insecure or scared or anxious or whatever that naggy feeling is telling me I'm off. You know, I'm being curious and how come? And I'm really looking into that. Uh, and I'm thinking that I've been uh, for a while also thinking that with my understanding of the principles, I shouldn't have all these negative emotions or I should kind of live in a, a state of bliss. Naturally, I'm just saying that as a uh, as a kind of a, an illusion, but but um, with the focusing on the negative, can that create more thinking about it rather than somehow accepting just the flow of life and how I naturally move up and down and just accepting in a way yeah. what is life and i can embrace that whole whole situation no matter whether i'm up or down and and just allow an acceptance of it in a way to not create unnecessary thinking about uh, yeah to get out of the negative feeling yes thank you on it thank you because this is fine tuning <laughs> so I don't see getting curious as focusing on the negative. Getting curious around the negative, for me, means looking beyond the negative. What is the negative point, the negative, pointing towards? What possibility is it pointing me towards? Right, so, I, it is a way of navigating it. It is a way of embracing it. It is a way of actually letting it be. I think a lot of people 
take this, oh, you can be okay with it, just flow, as almost ignoring it, which is a way of almost wanting it to go away. Not, it's not really embracing it. Do you see, do you see what I mean? It's a very fine line on it. But you know, it's like, oh yes, well, I will, I will let it be, but I will just go and be happy over here. Yeah, you can do that. Of course you can do that. That's not necessarily embracing it. That's not necessarily letting it be. That is not necessarily letting go of it. Last year I spent quite a few months living with the question, what does let go mean? <laughs> you know, because everybody, let it go, let it go. What does that even mean, let it go? How, what is it, like not seeing it? it what, what is it? And I, I don't have a definite answer in it, but the closest I came to a definite answer was, let it be. Allow it to be. And for me, letting something be is loving something. Allowing something to be is loving something. Like, look at yourself, Annette. What in the universe is not letting you be? Even if what you're choosing to be is miserable. Is anything in the universe telling you, no, that is not right, you should not be doing that, you should not be existing that way, that is not the right way to suffer, Annette. Nothing is, right? You are being 100% allowed, which translates as you are being 100% loved. Is this making sense, it? So, I get really curious around the negative because I know it is showing me that I am not seeing something. I'll give you a really shitty but very common example, okay? He hasn't called me or messaged me. And I do not agree with that. And so I start to worry, uh, be upset, get mad, uh, create stories in my head, everything, right? But everything is projected out there. You should not be doing this. You should not be acting this way. Things should be happening in a different way because if they were, it would mean that. So you see my story, my mind is already creating the story, the interpretation, the whole thing. So instead of looking at all that, I say, huh, I'm getting upset because he hasn't called me or messaged me. Isn't that interesting? What does that mean that I am getting upset? That means that I believe relationships should be different. At my age, you know, because we are adults here. <laughs> and, and so I start looking I, I turn my eyes inwards and I discover what, what the upset is trying to point me to, which ultimately always is, listen, honey, you're looking at this in a very personal way through a very real belief. Maybe it's time to let go a little of it, right? And so I look at that belief and I say, what do I know how relationships should be? What the hell do I know about how my relationship with this particular person should be like? I don't know. I don't know what relationships are up to, <laughs> do you see? I don't know if this relationship is here to show me something or to... I, don't, I have no idea. And so I let go of that and I get really curious. Again, saying, huh, I wonder 
if a relationship where no messaging and calling is happening in 10 days would be something that I could be comfortable with. And I get curious. And it turns out that 10 days of not messaging and calling are a fantastic thing for me in this moment in my life, Annette. Do you see? It opened a whole new world of possibilities that I didn't know existed. That's what I mean by getting curious. Not, oh, let's focus on, I feel bad. No. It's curiosity, it's holding it lightly. It's being willing to explore it. It is allowing it to be there and show me whatever it wants to show me without making it into something else. Does that answer your question, Annette? Absolutely. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And what comes to mind is also that it comes to my attention. It comes to, into my awareness uh -huh. in, a, in a different way than before I had that opportunity to see it differently, being reminded by that feeling that, oh, here's something to... Yeah look at or to explore and to be curious and that that is it comes into my awareness to allow me to have a different experience with it next time but beautiful answer thank you so much maria thank you but i love what you're saying like i'm having a different relationship to it one more different how many more could there be i don't know and I will never know unless I get curious, right? So judgment is always a closed, limited world. Curiosity, whew. curiosity is always tell me more, inform me. And when you create that void, guess what, Annette? It gets filled up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really loved your answer and your question. Thank you. That was so powerful, Marina. And I'm laughing to myself because when you said you went through a few months of living with let it go, I went through a week of living with let it go. And I kept ending up singing that Frozen song in my head from the Disney movie. But that's another story. I'm not sure how much time you have left, Marina, but we have one more question in a direct message. But I just wanted to take a moment to read out a comment from a friend of mine, Billy Mann. He said, OK, I've been in the 3P world for a long time, and there's been very few moments where I've experienced the beautiful clarity so lovingly expressed as I'm witnessing today. Thank you, Marina. Oh, Billy, I want to hug you. <laughs> I just wanted to share that live for uh, everyone's benefit, because it's also rare that me as host would feel stuck for words, but I'm genuinely in some kind of energy bubble from your beautiful words today. But Marina, do you have one more or time for one more I question? I do. Yes. OK. Where do you stand from a principles angle on the law of attraction and manifestation, financial or otherwise? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is so juicy. <laughs> My house has huge windows. And it's divided, and so the, the, the windows from the upper side don't open, and the windows from the lower side open completely. Yes? And one day, a hummingbird came into the house and was trying to get out through the upper window, and it could not find the way out. Yes? It kept getting... But you know, hummingbirds, they fly really, really fast, right? So he was pushing so hard. You know, he was just like... Uh, uh, and I was seeing it 
and I, you know, it was just like, just get, just get down, come on, you know, just fly lower. But this went on for almost an hour. So he would get exhausted and he would, you know, slide down the window and he would rest on the division. And then he would rest and off. So he would have strength again and then he would go at it again. And this happened for a long, long time. So I had time to observe and get curious on it. And I was looking at the hummingbird and I was trying to imagine his inner monologue, you know, like, if I had just trained harder, I could break through this window. My wings would be stronger. If I had listened to my father and drank from the flowers instead of the feeder, that shit, you know? <laughs> like, and, and then it went and it became a law of attraction. Hummingbird, you know, like, this window is going to disappear now. It is going to dissolve in front of me and I will break through. Guys, clarity. This is not how things work. Right? Now, do we attract what we are? Yes, we do. But what we are is not parrots repeating what we want. What we are is creators. So it's, there is truth to it. It's just, there is a misunder, there is a basic misunderstanding around it. It is not that I can sit and decree what I want. No, I need to go out and create it. I need to find my power as creator and make it happen. Not my power as worker and make it happen. It's as easy as a hummingbird. You just need to see where it is. It's clarity. Every possibility is available. Yes. You just need to point yourself in the right direction. Pointing yourself in the right direction means a ton of different things. But let's go with lack okay because a lot of people around the law of attraction deal with lack yes now <sighs> okay if i look at me I'm at my immediate surroundings and i say what is lacking you know the famous kohan what is lacking i can tell you a cup of hot coffee is lacking in my room but there is, a hot of, there is a cup of hot coffee in my house. So it's lacking from my room, but not from my house. Now, if I look at my house and I say, what is lacking? I can say, well, a pool is lacking or the man of my dreams is lacking. But a pool is not lacking in my neighborhood and the man of my dreams is not lacking in my country or at least the world, yes? So if we continue like this and then we, we open our perspective and suddenly we have the universe and we ask what is lacking, guess what? Nothing is lacking. Everything is available right now. You just have a very limited perspective of what is being available to you right now because it's just short vision. That's it. Now, if I believe something is lacking. I am creating lack. Yes? This is, this is a mind bender, guys. This is, this is a conundrum. I am creating lack. And then from that creation, I am trying to fulfill that lack. Do you see how impossible that is? So when my starting point is the creation of lack, the whole journey becomes about fulfilling that lack, which is not there because I am creating the lack. Okay? Now, when I understand wholeness and I see that everything is available, 
and that is my starting point, I become an expression of that totality, not an expression of lack. Is this making sense? Yes? Okay. The journey becomes about being the expression of it. So I become the creator and expression of abundance and wholeness and oneness and totality. There is no need to create lack at all, no matter how you look at it. What do you want your journey to be? And so here we go. If I am the law of attraction, attracting money and abundance from my creation of lack, it's impossible. I am creating the lack and from there, there is nothing I, I can create to fulfill that lack. If I place myself in the realization and truth of abundance and I become an expression of it, guess what? I already attracted it. It's already there. I'm just now an expression of it. Ta-da! That is we a mind not, bender. I know, but that's the thing. We are not lacking anything. We are just, we just have a surplus thinking and that surplus is lack, you know? It's like my kids when they have an ice cream and they are very happy because they have an ice cream and then the guy standing next to them has a double scoop ice cream and then they're suddenly miserable because they don't have two. No, you, you have everything already. Stop creating lack. Come on, people. That's so powerful, Marina. And you remind me of when Dick and Bettinger talks about the small wave looking at the big wave. You know, the small wave needs to suddenly do a flying foam webinar to be more without ever knowing that they just have to look down and see what they're part of. Marina, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for your authenticity, your wisdom, the power of your presence. It's really been a joy to have you with us and with this, our, our public group. If people would like to find you or to work with you or to reach out to you or just to say, hello, Marina, where can they find you? They can place themselves in abundance and totality. <laughs> they can attract and manifest you. <laughs> yes. No, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me in marinagaland.com. Anywhere. I am everywhere. Donuts. <laughs> They can ask you or Martin or, you know, or Mark. Mark, I love you. <laughs> yeah, I'm everywhere. It's okay. Thank we you so, so much. We are so grateful for you. So thank you so much. And if everyone would like to unmute themselves and thank Marina on their way out of the room, that would be <laughs> great. And Mastermind members will stay behind. All the best, everyone, and thanks again, Marina. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Right. Good Thomas, I have, I have a request. Can you send me the chat? Because I didn't have time to read the questions and everything. So would you? Absolutely. Please? Yeah, I'll yes, download it and 